a long time and I'll step over the side and let Sue okay. introduce herself. My name is Susan Quinn and I'm an OT by trade and I am the rehab manager of inpatient and outpatient at South Suburban Hospital. And I've been in the advocate system about 15 years. Don't leave the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So I'm going to start out just with a few little cancer statistics. Um, so the most common cancers in men are prostate, lung, and colorectal. And in women, it's breast, lung, and colorectal. So that's kind of what we're a little... Um, so then looking at what is our probability of getting cancer, um, for men, all sites, you know, no matter whether it's prostate, melanoma, kidney, one in two. So one in every two males will get some kind of cancer in their lifetime. And for women in all sites, um, no matter what kind it is, one in three women will, um, get some kind of cancer in their lifetime. So, th so those statistics are pretty high. Um, pretty high probability that either you or someone you love is going to um, get cancer sometime in their life. There's a variety of reasons why people get cancer. Um, some of them are things that we do to ourselves, like maybe we smoke, um, have a sedentary lifestyle. Um, there are other parts that we have no control over. Sometimes it's a family history, um, reproductive factors, you know, especially the um, ones that are more common. So the breast, the colorectal, um, those we really don't have as much um, influence on. Um, it's just kind of our genetics um, and socioeconomic factors. At times you think, okay, those maybe are, we have something to do about them, but at times we really don't. Um, you know, we are... Um, you know, you know, our lifestyle, our not so much our lifestyle, but our economic status is not one that we can always change. And so those are things sometimes that we can't change that end up affecting us and causing us to have some of the different types of cancer. The biggest thing about this is the number of survivors that have um, that we have now over the years. So before, you know, cancer, somebody would get cancer and it was immediate death sentence. Um, now 18% are living with cancer 20 plus years since their diagnosis, 47 or 10 plus and 69 or five plus. So it's no longer that death sentence that it used to be. So in 2022, right now, there's about 7.9 million cancer survivors. They're looking at in 2032, there'd be 22.5 million survivors. And in 20, 40, 40, you're looking at 26 million cancer survivors. So there's a lot of people that are going to get cancer, but a lot of them are going to survive from that disease. So you have an increasing cancer diagnosis, but less people are dying from it. So there's more people living with cancer at this point. So it's more of a chronic disease. I usually compare it to like diabetes. You know, there's a lot of people in the world who have diabetes. They learn to live with it. They learn to manage it. They handle the differences. They know <clears throat> what to do to make sure that it's handled, that it's taken care of, that it doesn't affect them. And the biggest thing about um, cancer itself, I really feel like is that it's the effects of the treatment and not necessarily the cancer itself that causes you to have a lot of the issues or concerns that you have to deal with. I know one of our um, physiatrists here at the hospital, he actually went in for an unrelated test or procedure and they found that he had cancer. So he went in, he looked fine and it was throughout his treatments that you looked at him and said, wow, he looks really bad. It wasn't the cancer itself. It was just the treatments that he was going under. Um, so this results in a growing need for awareness, diagnosis and treatment of the musculoskeletal, cardiovascular and functional problems that happen because of the treatment of cancer. So some of the different things that happen after you have cancer treatment, you're at an increased risk for diabetes, an increased risk for heart disease, um, a diminished quality of life just for a variety of reasons, just because of those other things that pile up. Fatigue, that's one of the big things that happens to, we'll get into that a little bit, about 93 to 97% of people who have been diagnosed with cancer. Um, lymphedema, um, diminished bone density, 
functional limitations. So having difficulty doing your activities of daily living, your bathing, dressing, grooming, um, decreased cognitive function. So a lot of people will have um, chemo brain pain at various sites, whether it's surgical, surgical pain, a stretching pain from muscles that are tight, various types of pain, neuropathies from the medications that you've been given and sleep quality and quantity. Um, very difficult to sleep um, and stay asleep. Um, so various things that are done in order to mitigate your cancer, you can have surgery to remove the cancer radiation to shrink it. Um, chemotherapy again to combat it. There's hormonal treatments and biological therapies. Um, as a result of surgery, a lot of people have pain. It's an incision, um, range of motion limitation. So depending on where they do the surgery, you're not able to move either an arm or a leg or your trunk your neck, wherever that surgery may have been, you're not able to move it like you were before. Um, because of incisions, you have scar tissue buildup. So that makes you not able to move as freely as you were before. Um, soft tissue tightness, the same thing as if you're not used to moving or you're protecting an area so you don't move as much, things start to tighten up. Postural changes. A lot of women who have undergone breast cancer treatment um, will kind of round their shoulders and kind of protect their chest area. So a lot of postural changes, um, rounded shoulders, kind of stooping, um, strength loss. You're not moving. You're not moving those muscles. They automatically start to lose their strength. And then in certain instances, you have swelling, especially after surgery. Radiation causes tissue tightness. And what a lot of people don't know is the effects of radiation can progress up to 10 years post radiation. So you could have radiation in year 2020 and that tightness can consist, can continue for 10 more years. So um, it does play um, a huge impact on your body. Um, it also causes a lot of fatigue. Again, postural changes, decreased range of motion, because when you have that tissue tightness, you're not able to move those body parts like they were before. If you're not moving your body parts, you have decreased strength. Chemotherapy. Some chemotherapy drugs are cardiotoxic, so they affect your heart, so your heart doesn't function as it should. You can have strength loss. Again, fatigue, muscle loss. And this is a big part where the neuropathy comes in is from the effects of the chemotherapy drugs. Um, you can have weight gain. So different people have different effects and based on what drug you're given, um, some people have weight gain or some people have a weight loss and get uh, have cachexia. And then hormone therapy can put women into early menopause. So that actually causes some bone loss and osteoporosis, but it also can cause some weight gain as well. Messing with our hormones is not good. <laughs> and then there's also biologic therapies. Um, that's the use of the body's immune system or hormonal, hormonal system to kill cancer cell, uh, cells, not cells. Um, very active areas of um, cancer research right now. Um, and it can also cause weight gain and bone loss. I'm gonna let not trip on that. <laughs> cancer related fatigue is something that um, is frequently found with cancer patients. It can be distressing, it's persistent, um, it's subjective sense of physical, emotional, and or cognitive tiredness or exhaustion, exhaustion related to your cancer or the treatment. It doesn't have anything to do with the activities that you've done prior to that. It's, um, but it interferes with your everyday functioning. Again, it can be physical, emotional, or cognitive. The cancer-related fatigue, it's a biological process. Even if you eliminate the things that make you tired, you're still going to have it. It's reported in 70 to 100% of patients undergoing cancer treatment. The patients report fatigue lasting months to years after concluding treatment. It is not alleviated by rest. So thinking I'm fatigued, I'm just gonna stay in bed all weekend, that is not going to do it. The worst thing is rest. Treatment of fatigue, it's trying to be as active as possible as you go through your treatment, trying to do all your everyday activities that you can do. Those with an extensive history may be needed 
you know, you might need to be referred to therapy, physical therapy or occupational therapy, and also initiating a exercise program to work on endurance and strength exercises. Research has shown the only evidence-based treatment for cancer-related fatigue is exercise. So move. <laughs> um, there's hours of activity before and post-diagnosis that is going to be adjusted, but you want to move and do what you can at the, at the level you're at. Exercise can help alleviate your cardiopulmonary, your breathing, muscular skeletal strengthening and movement, and your functional deficits, doing your everyday activities that may impact your um, dressing, bathing, um, homemaking activities, or even your job especially pain and fatigue and weakness are very common during and after cancer treatment. Studies have shown that a large study looked at an exercise habits of breast cancer patients. There were over 2000 women that participated in this study. Um, exercising or walking an average pace of one to three times a week cut the risk of dying from breast cancer by 23%. If they increased that average pace to three to five hours a week, the percentage went to 50%, cut the risk of um, dying. And increasing up to five to eight hours was 51%. Regardless of what they did before that, um, can, the diagnosis. Colon cancer and exercise, it increases your quality of life, lowering your fatigue, your tiredness. It increases your well being, your physical well being, and your functional well being. There was a 50% reduction in recurrence and mortality with six hours of moderate exer physical exercise or activity per week in colon cancer patients. Prostate cancer and exercise there's a study three hours of moderate intensity um, activity per week re reduced the mortality rate by 30% and lowered disease progression by 57%. The cancer treatment, prostate cancer treatment often included radiation and prostatectomy resulting in incontinence. The study showed that men who were active and not obese had a decreased incidence of incontinence. 40% of the obese and inactive were incontinent one year after surgery. Research shows the benefits go, go beyond cancer survival. It helps to control weight, it can maintain healthy bones, muscles, and joints. It can reduce your risk of developing high blood pressure and diabetes, promotes psycho psychological well being. It reduces the risk of dying from heart disease. It improves, improves your balance and your risk of falls and broken bones. And it can decrease your dependence on others for help with normal activities of daily living. Exercise precautions. You always want to check with your doctor before starting any program. It's important to know if your treatments can affect your heart and your lungs, such as chemo and radiation to the chest. Cancer team, your cancer team will check your blood counts during treatment to ensure it is safe for you to exercise. Sometimes too, um, a fall or other things could cause internal bleeding or bruising with some of the treatments that you're on. You don't want to exercise if you have a blood, low blood cell count, you're anemic. If you have low white blood cell count or take amino suppressants, avoid public gyms and places until your counts are safe. You don't want to get exposed to anything that could compromise your health anymore. You also want to avoid exercise if your mineral levels, such as your sodium and potassium, are not normal. That could in, um be due to excessive vomiting and diarrhea during your treatment. Exercise, you want me to do this one? Okay, exercise is wonderful. It will also, it's going to help with your waist, weight loss management and it's a critical part of the long-term treatment success. Being too thin or too heavy are not healthy. So you wanna maintain a, a good weight and also increasing your muscle, muscle weighs more. So um, if you increase those muscles, your weight will go up too. Exercise is the best way to control your weight. Normal weight cancer survivors live longer than overweight survivors. 
your exercise guidelines. Exercise should involve aerobic activity, cardio, strength training, flexibility, and balance training. Just being active is not exercise. You want to really do intentional exercise, have a program, mix it up a little bit during the week, but re really be intentional in it. Yes, you want to do everything that you can in your normal day with physical activity, but really set an exercise program and be intentional. The benefits, it helps alleviate many of the side effects that result from the cancer and cancer treatment. Survivors attain the body weight optimal for long survivorship. And the exercise also helps release endorphins, which improves your mood and increase energy. When your moods increase, you usually want to do more and um, move more. You came in here. Yeah, <laughs> you were, you I were, here, um, she, yeah. you were pumped. Yeah, yeah. Your endorphins were so. going after your Zumba class. <laughs> um, the goals of exercise with cancer survivors, it's to regain and improve your physical function, improve your aerobic capacity, improve your strength, improve your flexibility, but also to improve your psychological and cognitive functions. It also improves your body image and your quality of life. By improving your body composition, decreasing fat, you're also maintaining weight and function in your, your body. It also reduces the delay of recurrence or a secondary cancer. Exercise Prescription for cancer survivors, avoid inactivity, really make exercise part of your daily routine. Just as you take your medications, make that part of your that. And again, you want it aerobic for that cardio workout. You want resistance for strengthening, flexibility for mobility and pain. Um, neuromotor exercise and balance to help with preventing falls. And you really want to follow the uh, American College Sports Medicine Exercise Guidelines as a good place to start also. Aerobic exercises um, should include 150 minutes of weekly moderate intensity exercises per week. That would be 30 to 60 minutes of moderate intensity exercise, a brisk, a brisk walk five times a week, or 20 to 60 minutes of a vigorous intensity exercise three times a week running. Gradual progression of exercise, time, frequency, and intensity is recommended for best adherence and least injury. So you want to take a day off or mix it up in there. It's better if it's done at a varied weight and interval training. You want, you know, you want to choose something that you like to do. You know, if you hate running, don't run. Um, you know, run, jog, walk, bike, swim. I don't swim. <laughs> treadmill, stationary bike, elliptical stair climber. Some people aren't gym people, but they get outside and walk. Um, classes, boot camp, Zumba, <laughs> circuit training. Um, and as you, you've been a great testimony, Gilda's offer some wonderful programming for those um, variety of classes. Sure. Barb's going to go over okay. resistance. Um, so the first part of exercise is your aerobics. You want to build up that heart. So then the next part is resistance. And I think something that they're coming out with over the years, realizing that strength training is a very, very important part of maintaining um, your body that we always used to think, okay, you got to get your aerobic in, but when you're doing your resistance and building your muscle, it does a lot more for you than actually that aerobic, um, exercise does. Um, so for resistance training, you want to train each major muscle group two to three days each week. Okay. The reason for that, that you want it to be separated by a day is that when you're actually strengthening those muscles, you're creating tears in the fibers of your muscle. So you need a day for those tears in that muscle to repair itself. And then you do it all over again. Those tears are actually the way that you can build that muscle mass up. Um, so two to four sets is kind of like what you're looking to do. That's going to help improve strength and power. Um, so eight to 12 reps, improve strength and power, 10 to 15, improve strength in middle age and older people. Um, and then 15 to 20 reps improves muscular endurance. Um, as I said, you want to wait about, um, 48 hours between resistance training exercises. Um, a lot of women will say, I don't want to lift heavy. 
you are not, you don't have the testosterone to build Arnold Schwarzenegger muscles. That's not going to happen. Um, but you do need that, you know, breakdown of that muscle in order to build it up to give you that additional strength. Um, the one thing that happens is that when you build that lean muscle, it actually leads to a higher metabolism. And when you have muscles that are working, even after you stop lifting, after you stop doing your strength training, you continue to burn. Whereas when you're doing aerobic conditioning, once you get off, once you stop walking, once you get off that treadmill, it stops, that fat burning stops. So your, your um, lean muscle keeps working throughout the day. So it definitely has a much bigger impact on your body than just aerobic conditioning. You still need your aerobic conditioning because your heart is a muscle and you need to work that as well. Um, but strength training has um, really needs to be an important part of your exercise program. A lot of options out there for you to do strength training. You can, if you are a gym person, you can do weight machines, um, get some small weights, hand, um, dumbbells at home. If you don't like to go to the gym, if you don't have the money or the opportunity to have those weights, you can fill up, you know, um, milk jugs with either sand or water to give you weight. You can use cans of vegetables, whatever, you know, what are they? 16 ounce cans? That's a pound. Um, so whether it's a one pound can of green beans or a one pound hand weight, same thing. <coughs> Um, there's a lot of resistance bands too um, that you can use for exercise or even just your own body weight, um, which is a lot more than one pound. So things like push-ups, squats, lunges, things like that will give you additional resistance for your exercises. <clears throat> for upper body, main muscle groups that you want to look at are your biceps. They actually bend your elbow. Okay, so doing bicep curls, you want to work your triceps, which is the back of your arm. That's what do they call them? The hello buddies. Mm -hmm. It's like when you wave, it jiggles, they call them hello buddies. So your triceps straighten your elbows. You want to do exercises that are going to straighten your elbow. That's going to work and strengthen those triceps. Your shoulders actually have three muscles on your shoulders, the front, the center, and the back, but things like lifting your arms overhead. Um, if that's a little bit too difficult, um, some people have some shoulder problems, just keeping your arms down and keeping those arms lower than your shoulders. So lifting those arms out to the side is going to work those shoulder muscles. Um, so either just lifting them out to the side, lifting them out this way um, are going to help work those shoulders. Chest, we all, I don't know. Well, I did this cause I was not well endowed as a child. What was it? We must, we must, we must increase our bus. <laughs> oh, I knew there was the second part. The bigger, the better, uh, the, the tighter, the sweater. Yes. <laughs> you, you never heard that before. <laughs> Um, yeah, so squeezing your arms together or bringing your chest up. If you do push-ups there, that's going to work your chest as well. Your back, your back is very important just because the more you work, we are a very um, forward society. So we sit at desks, we do a lot of computer work. Um, so we're always like this. So our back muscles are just kind of hanging out there. They don't do anything. It's bad for our posture then too, because we're always like this. So we really need to work those upper back muscles to get us sitting up straighter. The other thing is when we walk, if we're stooped over when we walk, that's more puts, puts us more at a risk for falls as well. So working those shoulder muscles, so squeezing those shoulder blades together in the back. Um, and concentrating on making sure that we're not lifting our shoulders up to our ears and really keeping our shoulders relaxed, but working those middle shoulder muscles is very important, bringing those shoulders back where they should be. Um, and then also just pulling down lat pulls, so working those side back muscles and then rows. So again, squeezing those middle back muscles. Lower body, you have your quadriceps, which are your front of your thighs, big muscles. Um, they actually help to straighten your knees. A lot of your lower body exercise kind of works a combination of your leg muscles. Um, so things like squats, lunges. Other thing that you wanna do is make sure that you kind of do it in various directions. So if you're doing lunges, you wanna take some of those lunges forward 
You want to take some of those lunges backwards. Sometimes you want to take them out to the side. So kind of on a <clears throat> diagonal. So that helps work the muscles in different directions. The other thing it does is that it helps you um, train your body in ways that you functionally move. So we don't always walk straight forward and straight back. If, you know, if I'm working in the kitchen and I'm cooking dinner, I'm here. I don't just walk straight and then go back and then turn and walk straight. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to grab something here. So I'm always working in different directions. So if you move your um, exercises in different directions, that also helps to work those muscles and strengthen them in those different directions. Your hamstrings, they're on the back of your thigh. They bend your knees. Um, so things like deadlifts. So where you bend, um, kind of keeping bent from your hips, kind of keeping your knees straight, um, laying flat, bringing your heels to your, so laying on your stomach, bringing your heels to your butt, bending that knee helps to work those hamstrings. Your glutes, your tush, your buttocks, whatever name you would like to call that too. They extend your hips or bring your hips forward. So laying on your back, bridging those hips up helps to work your tush. Um, your inner thigh and your outer thigh, those are important because we do so much forward and back. We don't in our daily function, we don't work those inner and outer thigh muscles as much. Um, so your inner thigh actually bring your legs in towards your body and your outer thigh brings it away from your body. So anything where you're just standing and bringing that leg in and out is going to activate those muscles. When you are doing some of these standing activities, it's very important that you watch out for safety and make sure that you do some of these exercises. I always tell people do them at your kitchen counter or near your kitchen counter. So you have something to hang on to in case you start to lose your balance. Um, so it's there for you. It's kind of a nice height where you're not bending over um, and you can move the way you need to move. Flexibility, that's your stretching, getting, making sure that those muscles work in both directions the most um, that they can so that they're stretched out in each way. Um, you wanna do flexibility exercises at least two to three days per week. Um, you wanna stretch all major muscle groups and tendons your muscles are like rubber bands. If you take a rubber band and you stretch it and then you let it go, it doesn't do anything. But if you take that rubber band, stretch it and hold it for a good 30 seconds, it's going to stretch out. And that's what you need to do to your muscles. So you can't just do a quick stretch, move it in and out, stretch and hold those muscles. You want to do a couple of them because each time you do them, so say you stretch your calf muscle, for 30 seconds. The next time you do it, it's going to stretch a little bit, for a little bit further. And then that third time you stretch that calf muscle, it's going to stretch even farther. So you want to stretch and hold, and then do a couple of them in a row to get the maximum stretch that you can for that muscle. They, um, these flexibility exercises are most effective when the muscles are warm. So you want to try and do something to warm up the muscles first. So whether you're standing in place and just, you know, doing a small march, kind of step inside to side, just something to kind of get the heart rate going a little bit, kind of warm up the muscles and then go into a stretch. Um, you want to work from head to toe. So for your neck, you can look side to side. And again, you would kind of look to one side and hold it. And then you would look to the other side and hold. And then you want to bring your ear to your shoulder. When you do that, you want to make sure that you keep those shoulders relaxed, that you don't bring those shoulders up to those ears. You can also kind of bring that chin to your chest. I would only go ear to shoulder and then bring it to the front, never round through the back. So never bring your neck and round it all the way around. A lot of people will have arthritis in the neck. And so it's just not a safe movement to do. So always keep that neck rotation to the front only. Um, shoulders, you can do shoulder circles forward and back. So these you wouldn't hold, but it just starts to get those muscles moving a little bit. So you can do them forward, you can do them backwards, make them a little bit bigger each time to get through the whole shoulder range of motion. 
my favorite shoulder exercise or stretch is actually just bringing one arm across that chest and holding it in. It just gets through the whole shoulder, even through that back of the um, shoulder. This would be one that you would just hold for that 20 to 30 seconds. And then you would switch and do the other one. I'd be glad that we only have two arms or it would take <laughs> us forever. Then your trunk is very important to your core. That gives you a lot of your balance and your stability when you're moving as well. So if you just reach your hand kind of down to one side, I don't know if you remember when you were a child, I'm a little teacup. I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here's my handle, here's my spout. Again, that's gonna kind of get a stretch through your trunk. And then even just bringing your arms up, and twisting one side and holding, and then twisting to the other side and holding. And then going down to those, um, to those legs, um, for that front thigh muscle, um, you really a lot of times need to hang on to something to do that, but just bringing your heel to your butt, sometimes you have to, um, you know, grab onto your pants or something like that. I know you can't see me. I don't know. I don't know if, yeah. yeah. Oh, can they see me? Okay. So just bringing your heel to your butt this way. If you can't grab that, grab your pants, pull them up, um, kind of helps. And then make sure you do the other one. When you do this one, what you want to watch out for is that you keep your knee to your knee. So you don't want your knee way out here. You don't want it too far forward. You really are trying to stretch through this front of your hip and your thigh. I'm very tight. <laughs> and then um, if you bring one heel out in front of you and just kind of sink back again, hang on, you're gonna get a stretch through the upper part of your butt through the back of that thigh. Bringing those toes up helps too. You're going to feel a little bit more of a stretch. Start to feel it in your calf as well. If you reach down a little bit more, you feel it a little more. Reach to the other side. Okay. Going a little bit deeper if you can. Reaching for the toes. The more flexible you get. The thing about flexibility is that we all genetically have a different amount of flexibility in our body. Um, I was never somebody who was able to do the splits, but you know, I had girlfriends that could do both, you know, both the regular splits and the Chinese splits without a problem. So you do have some innate flexibility in your body. The other thing about um, stretching is when you do stretch. You want to go to the point where you feel a stretch, but not pain. If you feel pain, you've gone too far. Then you're going to be sore, and then you're not going to want to stretch. So go till you feel that stretch. Hold that for 30 seconds. When you go to do your second one, you'll probably be able to go a little bit further. You'll still be able to feel that stretch and not pain. And then when you go to the third one, the same thing will happen. So gradually, you'll get to where that motion is more without pain. So you don't want to go to where it's painful. Okay. Neuromotor exercises you should be doing two to three times a week. Those exercises are going to involve your balance, your agility, coordination, proprioceptive training, knowing where your body is um, with that. And some good examples are Tai Chi on that. Those are it's wonderful for balance um, and yoga. And they should be 20 to 30 minutes a day. Balance, that's very important too. We want to make sure we're working on our balance to prevent falls. And falls sometimes create broken bones, which that we do not want. So when you're doing balance exercises, you're 
your base is support. It's going to be more narrow. So your legs are going to be closer together. Also a good exercise is single leg standing. Just try to stand on one leg as long as you can. And that another ch more challenging, but make sure you have something to hang on to. Yeah. It's trying to do it with your eyes closed also on that, but you definitely need something to hang on to because when we use our vision, you're focusing on something that's a little easier to do that single leg stance. Also trying to exercise standing on a pillow or a cushion. You're incorporating your core, your muscles to hold you steady to do those things. Um, also exercise balls, sitting on an exercise ball to do some of your upper body exercises. You're, you're working on balance and strengthening at the same time. I'll tell people when they're doing their dishes at home, you're already at your kitchen counter. Try washing your dishes standing on one foot or standing on a pillow or some kind of a cushion. Um, so you're kind of doing your exercise yeah. and your housework at the same time, but you I, still have that balance. You still have that mm -hmm. safety. I had a patient who um, stood on one leg while they brushed their teeth oh, no. and that. So every morning he got padded. Yoga is also a wonderful exercise. Um, it's a great way to get back into exercising. And also you can progress it from chair to standing. Um, there's so many programs in um, our library has uh, chair yoga and um, park districts and other things too. And I'm sure the guild is, guild is okay. I, I'm, I'm not surprised, <laughs> yeah. but again, that can be something you can progress, yes, yes, they do. you know, where you're at in that, you know, sometimes I look at yoga and I'm like, my body is never going to go into that position. <laughs> I don't know what <laughs> on that. And so then I get discouraged. Um, but with yoga too, you're also paying attention to your breathing and you're listening to your body. It's relaxation. And it's always slow, controlled movements, which is the best. When you start doing things very rapidly, you're actually doing muscle damage. So you want to do things slow and controlled. Um, it identifies areas with limited movement. If you're not as flexible, you're not going to be doing that downward, downward dog or whatever that one is. Um, and it can be modified too basic movements of the joints. Again, I think yoga sometimes sounds intimidating to people, but to find that program where you're at, it helps with sleep, your sleep quality. It relaxes you helping with that. And it folks focuses on stretching your core stability and balance, which are extremely important. Um, in the end of the presentation, we do have some basic stretches that, and we're going to share those. Um, Arb went over some of these already. Yeah. The neck stretches, um, the neck rotation. I can go back if you're and that utilizing. And again, you don't want to bounce a nice, slow, static stretch and holding it. Yeah, this kind of gives you a little bit of extra. Yeah. You can. A lot of people hold a lot of their tension in their shoulders, so the neck stretches help. Okay. Neck rotation, Barb had demonstrated that, you know, just gently turning that neck. Mine cracks. <laughs> Shoulder rolls, which that I think we talked about too. You know, just gentle, slow, you're going back bringing those shoulders up towards your ear and trying to incorporate the breathing, you know, exhaling when your shoulders are back and down in a circular motion. And I know that's sometimes hard to coordinate all those, those, the breathing and the motion. Goal post arms, it increases shoulder awareness and range of motion, you know. I don't think we see it too much with the bears where we can go touch down <laughs> lately, but <laughs> maybe next week. <laughs> <laughs> on that, but inhaling through your nose and raising both arms to your shoulder height so they look like goalposts, and then inhale and hold. As you exhale, raise your arms up and inhale on the way down. So it's you're exhaling on the more resistive or against gravity. And these are only, you know, to repeat three to four times, it's not um, a lot. Scapular retraction, that back muscle, what 
bringing those increases shoulder awareness and range of motion. It's beginning in that goal pose position. You inhale and bring your shoulders back. Hold for one to two breaths and then exhale and release. It's like really expanding your chest, bringing those two shoulder blades together. The modified camel, I don't really, <laughs> Is there a chance? Okay, it's all right. It's inhale through the nose as your stomach expands. As you exhale, circle the arms around the back of the chair and hold for several breaths. Oh. Okay. So you're sitting in the chair, a little bit more on the edge. And as you exhale, circle the arms around back to the chair. It's almost like pushing that chest out while you're sitting there and hold for several breaths and then return to the, the top. Again, it's opening those chest muscles on that. And I stretch through the low back too. So these are really simple chair exercises, a good starting point, but also, you know, checking out what other your health club, your library, park district, guildas would have to get you start. Um, tips to sticking to your exercise program, set short-term goals not and long-term goals, but have little, you know, start small. Like I'm going to, you know, make it, I'm going to exercise three times this week. You know, to be a little more specific, to make you more accountable, you might say, I'm going to exercise on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday makes you a little more accountable. Sometimes even telling a friend that you made these goals makes, you know, some goals and accountability really, I think, help the follow through. And then long-term goals. What is it that you want? Why are you exercising? For better health, for better mood um, with that. But have fun. I mean, again, as we said, don't pick something. You know, if you hate running, don't say I'm going to, you know, running is your goal. If, you know, you don't like swimming, <laughs> Don't put that on your agenda. Find something you like to do. Or, you know, if you have a buddy, you know, what do you guys like to do together? Um, do something different. Keep it fresh. You know, mix it up. You know, biking or your weights. Um, do cardio. Do um, resistive. And again, ex exercise with others. Get a partner. And then a good thing, too, is to track it. You know, use charts or records. You set your goals. And then, you, you know, monitor how you're doing. Yeah, I worked out on Wednesday. I was doing, you know, I used a five pound weight, 10 repetitions and what exercises you did. And I think most of us too have activity trackers now too that, you know, I utilize mine to see, did I really get up there <laughs> that, you know, I felt like I did, but then I look at my Fitbit, oh, I wasn't getting really where I should have been. So I'll have to turn it up a little bit more, but it also, it can motivate you and then it tracks your progress. And then, you know, recognize and, and reward your achievements. Hey, you, you worked out or I got a program going, you know, pat yourself on the back, reward yourself, you know, go get that new shirt or pair of shoes or something, <laughs> whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but think of exercise as a drug, um, get enough to achieve the benefit. Um, too much can cause injury. So you want to really pace yourself. And um, you want the right exercise that's going to balance your strength, flexibility, aerobic, you know, mix it up again. Um, you know, when my doctor told me I'm on a medication, he said, um, med's fine, but your exercise is the best drug for you. I want you, he said, that's better than any drug I can give you. So it is a drug on that. Any questions or concerns? Oh, you are adventuring. Yeah. But I have that exciting that I have five. I missed it out. If I have the Zumba that I've been taking from five or six, that's too much, you know. If if you're enjoying, enjoying it, it and you're able to do it, right. then no. If if you start to feel like you're starting to get injured, like okay, <laughs> you know, my my ankles, it's too much for my ankles because they're both kind of dancey. So right. um 
But if you're not having any consequences, no. Make sure you hydrate extra that day yeah. if you're doing two exercise classes. Right. So that's something that we didn't talk about. It that's important too because the first time I did it, um, I came home and um, I think my hip was kind of sore a little bit. But I think it was fun because I was moving the other side. I wasn't doing that before. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the moves in the other dance space, you moved the other. So mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that felt good when I was doing it. But when I sat down, I was like, oh, it felt too good. I went on to my super class and exercise, and I got home. That's when I started feeling the difference. So I, the next week, I didn't go. I took off the next week. So I said, I'll do it every other week. Okay. And maybe it was just me getting used to it. Mm -hmm. well, because I hadn't been doing it. New muscles that you used. How did you feel the next day, though, after you did the two classes? Was it still? The next day, it wasn't bad. It was just really soreness, but I figured that was because I had been moving. <laughs> Right. Yeah. New set of so muscle groups. Okay, I'll just pace myself. You know, if I still feel like this for too many days, then next week I won't go out with every other week. But I just learned that not to kind of overload myself on a certain day. And listen to your body. That's what it, you know, if it's, if it's hurt. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because your hips, your arms, the whole body got the exercise. That it felt really good. Like you're sore, it was a good sore. They say if you're still sore 48 hours after, so the next day a little soreness is normal. Okay. But if you're still sore two days after, that's kind of an indication that you went overboard, that you did a so little bit too back. much. Okay. And when I started to say hydration is very important for your muscles when you're okay. exercising, they actually work more efficient, efficiently when they're hydrated than when they're not. So it's really important to make sure that you drink your water mm -hmm. when you are exercising. Yeah, yeah. I take a bottle of water.